Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to our Salado UMC Bible study. For those of you that are watching from around the country or beyond, uh, Salado is a town village, actually is what they call it here, of about 2,500 people situated about halfway between Waco and Austin. Uh, this is United Methodist Church, which has uh, been worshiping, meeting together for 150 years. And so it's uh, one of the older United Methodist churches in the state of Texas. Today we're looking at the New Testament lessons for Epiphany Sunday, which is the 3rd of January. It comes up day after tomorrow or depending on if you're watching this on Friday. Uh, it would be day after tomorrow. But uh, the first uh, text happens to be uh, a text that uh, presumably Paul wrote. Uh, there is some controversy about Colossians and uh, Ephesians as being things that Paul himself wrote. Many think that it was written by some of Paul's later disciples to uh, explain this theology in more detail. But what Epiphany is, is a manifestation of Jesus as the Messiah to the Gentiles. The word Messiah from Hebrew uh, basically means something like ruler or shepherd, and it's often used uh, in terms of the monarchy. So the king would be called uh, a Messiah, for example. Um, and, and so it's a foreign term to Gentiles or to the nations that are going to flow into Jerusalem as we uh, talked about this past week uh, with respect to Isaiah 60, which is one of the four readings for today. Um, I want you to know that uh, the manifestation of the Messiah or Jesus as the Messiah to the Gentiles is a giant step. In Hebrew theology, there are two kinds of people in the world. There are Jews who are the insiders and then there's everybody else. So if you're a Gentile, you could be from Africa, you could be from uh, the Far East, you could be from China, you could be from Australia, you could be from almost anywhere. But if you are not Jewish, then you are a Goyim or uh, a Gentile. So uh, this uh, manifestation or announcement or proclamation of Jesus as being the savior of all people and not just the Jews is a gigantic step. And it, if you read the book of Acts very carefully, you will see a, sort of a progression from the very beginning of Acts where only Jews were Christians to the end of Acts where uh, Gentiles have become Christians and in fact have overwhelmed the Jewish Christians by a number of 10 to 1, 50 to 1, 101, 1,000 to 1. Eventually, Gentiles will take over the church, although it was started by Jewish Christians like Paul, like Peter, like Barnabas, like Silas and uh, Aquila and Priscilla and people such as that. Uh, so this vital theme of the inclusion of the Gentiles into the church, and that's what Ephesians is about in part, is a, is a very big step and uh, is one that uh, Paul or his uh, proxy here writing the theology in Ephesians wants to emphasize. Um, there are a couple of things that I want to emphasize with this particular text, although there are many. One of the reasons that I do not believe that Paul wrote this particular epistle is that even though the theology is fairly consistent with his uh, letters that are beyond dispute, Romans, Philippians, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, uh, Philemon, and so forth, uh, 
the, the style of writing here in Ephesians is so much different than Paul's, um, you know, non-disputed uh, letters. Uh, Paul sometimes writes long, complicated sentences in Romans, for example, but uh, in the book of Ephesians, I think it is the first chapter is one long sentence. The sentences tend to be very long and sometimes convoluted. Now, given the fact that they were written first in Greek and then translated into Latin and then French and then eventually English, you can understand that when somebody says something is lost in translation, that this could be a, a, a very true statement. But uh, be that as it may, the first thing that I, I want to say is that, uh, that uh, the Ephesians are going according to Paul's dictates. They're going to uh, celebrate uh, this idea of uh, the Gentiles as being part of God's original intention. You will see the plan uh, of the mystery was hidden for the ages in God in, in verse 9. The mystery of the ages is that God has created Christ's church to include everybody, not just some, not just uh, those that are here and there, but everyone is invited. And perhaps many will not choose uh, to join this movement that has opened the door wide open for them. But the fact is the door has been opened for them and the door is a door that uh, Gentiles can walk through to become full uh, Christians. Uh, the second thing uh, it, about uh, this text is it tries to demonstrate not only the local and particular significance that this Christ event has for individuals or for smaller units of people such as households or families, but that it has cosmic significance. The significance of God opening the door for all means that uh, everybody, um, even the rulers and the authorities of the heavenly places, as we're told in uh, verse 10 of chapter three of Ephesians, uh, these are people who are uh, understanding and witnessing uh, the wisdom of God in a rich variety. In other words, in Christ's church, it is the epitome of a pluralistic society, whether the church is a house church of seven or 10 or 15 members, or whether it's like these big uh, mega churches that we see in places like Pennsylvania, Illinois, and Texas that could get to as many as 25,000 people uh, or the gigantic uh, Christian churches that we find in places like Korea where there might be between uh, 50,000 and 75,000 people as members. Now that's a little bit larger church than we're used to, but the truth of it, uh, the truth is that, uh, that that's what this uh, call in Ephesians is for, that nothing is to limit uh, God's church. And so this, the universal and cosmic dimensions of the Christ event cannot be overestimated. Um, what this means for the church today, uh, and this has to do with, uh, with Christians as Jews first, or Christians as Gentiles later in the first century, all this happens in the first century, is that as Jews trying to limit uh, the Gentile or nation's participation in the life of the church in the first century, today in the 21st century, what uh, Christians are to do is to be more um, hospitable to their Jewish brothers and sisters. While there may not be agreement about doctrine or dogma, uh, the truth of the matter is that we now have an obligation as Christians to open our arms wide and to give hospitality. 
to people. Uh, I think that uh, is is uh, an important sort of point of view for us to take as modern Christians, especially since we live in a world that is increasingly uh, pluralistic, uh, whether it's in schools or in towns or in social clubs, wherever it may be, uh, the mixing of languages, nationalities, religions, uh, politics, uh, economic situations, all of these things point to more mixing and we're becoming more and more like a tossed salad uh, of people in our culture. Now I want to flip back to uh, the book of Matthew, <coughs> the second chapter, the first 12 verses. This, as you know, is a very uh, familiar story. It's the story of the Magi, and they are uh, visiting Jesus. And this goes with the theme of Epiphany, which is Jesus is manifested, Jesus is revealed, Jesus is proclaimed as the Messiah, the King, the ruler, the potentate, the leader. Um, the savior of the world. And the world, in this case, has to do with Gentiles. As the Magi, uh, in our uh, hymnal, we sing, We Three Kings of Orient Are. But the truth is, the biblical text doesn't really tell us how many there were. It just says that Magi came from the east. Uh, this business of coming from the east is important because in the Bible, it is a literary signal that something important is about to happen. Uh, when uh, uh, Adam and Eve went east of Eden, it tells us that we're in for a, a change of status for them. When the wise uh, people, when the magi come from the east, we are signaled that this is going to be something important and to pay attention uh, to the text. Uh, the visit of the Magi is, a, of course, a very favorite story among our children. And sometimes we get, we get Luke and Matthew, we scramble them all around and we throw it out there and say, this is the children's pageant. But uh, in truth, they're different stories because Matthew has a certain agenda to push and Luke has another agenda to push. Uh, for the most part, uh, Matthew talks a lot about the conflict that Jesus had with the religious leaders of Judaism, which would have been uh, Pharisees, Sadducees, Zealots, Sicarii, uh, and, and different groups within Judaism. Uh, Luke, who probably wrote a bit later than Matthew, is more about bringing people together and trying to uh, find a mutual uh, platform, a foundation upon which Jew, Christians, Gentile Christians could all sort of agree and say, this is where we are going to live, and so let's go from there. Matthew tends to, Matthew was probably written around the year 70, reflects Jesus' uh, palaver uh, conflict with the religious leaders. Uh, Matthew writes it as if it happened in the early 30s of the first century, but probably what is more important for us to remember is that the uh, conflict between Jewish and Gentile Christians happened closer to 60s of the first century from which Matthew was drawing much of his materials. And you will find uh, many stories of conflict between the Pharisees and Jesus or the Sadducees and Jesus or the uh, other religious groups within Judaism with Jesus' disciples. That's where we will find these things. Uh, 
The first thing that uh, this story about uh, the Magi coming bearing gifts to Jesus is this announcement that Matthew makes very quickly after the birth story. Uh, Matthew's birth stories about Jesus are, are fairly brief. It's in uh, chapter uh, 1, verses 18 to the end of the first chapter. And then immediately we turn the page and we see that uh, Matthew is talking about the announcement of the Messiah. It's kind of like Matthew is saying, this is the coming out party for Jesus in that Jesus is now the new Messiah, so important, so fundamental to the understanding of life in this world that even magi, um, astrologers, we might call them, come from all the way from the East to visit this child. So important is he. And so uh, uh, for Matthew, uh, this is really the fulfillment of Isaiah 60 that we talked about last time, that the nations will come, they will bring wealth to Zion, to Jerusalem, and obviously to uh, to Jesus. Uh, a second emphasis in this particular story from Matthew is that Jesus Christ is the true King of Israel. Um, the monarchy had been a mixed bag in Israel for generations. Uh, finally, uh, Samuel was convinced by the people to give Israel a king so that they could be like other nations. And uh, for the most part, uh, the experiment in the monarchy was an unmitigated disaster for Israel. They had some good kings, but starting with Samuel, he ended poorly. Then we had King David, who did rather well for a very, very long time, but he still had his warts. Then we have Solomon that began promisingly, and eventually, before Solomon was done, uh, two leaders in Israel divided the kingdom into north and south, Israel and Judah, and uh, all of a sudden, we have a big mess on our hands. And most of the kings, most of them throughout the rest of Judah and Israel's history were, were ineffective or corrupt or worse. There were a few, Hezekiah was a good king, and there were a smattering of others. But for the most part, uh, they were not good at all. And so... With Matthew, we have sort of uh, a, the birth of a new story for the nation of Israel and Judah, that in Jesus, everything is going to be righted, and uh, the wrongs will also be uh, righted. And uh, the, the last thing that this uh, story wants to tell us, and this has a lot to do with Herod, saying that he wants to know where Jesus is so that he can uh, come and worship him. That's what he tells the Magi. But the truth of the matter is, uh, Herod wants to replicate what happened when Moses was born back in the book of Exodus, where we had the slaughter of innocents. The Pharaoh killed all of the male baby boys under, I guess if they were male, they would be boys, all of the infants that were male under the age of two, they were all slaughtered. And uh, Moses' mother and sister conspired to hide him, and then they gave him to uh, one of Pharaoh's handmaidens of his daughter, and uh, Moses becomes uh, Egyptian royalty, and grows up in the palace, and has every advantage that any Jewish child of the Pharaoh would have. And that's the way the story goes. What is important for us to know about this particular story is that Herod wants to do again to Jesus what they tried to do to Moses uh, so many centuries before, and, and that is to kill this king of the Jews who, 
who is recognized from birth as the uh, legitimate ruling authority for the Jewish uh, people. Uh, hostility towards Jesus and the gospel pretty much begins at uh, Jesus' birth and uh, is announced uh, in scripture by Matthew here in chapter two. So almost from the very beginning, uh, there has uh, been this uh, idea of hostility towards Jesus. I'm gonna flip over here to finish today by sharing one of the lines from uh, Luke's Magnificat, uh, which gives, uh, gives more credence to uh, this idea. Uh, he has shown strength with his arm, that is, uh, God in Christ. He has scouted the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. Uh, and so Luke and Matthew are both together on this point that there will be hostility towards Jesus. But in fact, God is in charge. He will rule and overrule. So I invite you to join us uh, next week as we uh, talk about the texts from the baptism of our Lord which will be for January the 10th. Thank you very much for being with us.